Neonic Void Productions presents Welcome to Spook Ocalypse. I am your host, Zio, and today I'm joined with the one, the only, you know him, you love him, Bunyip, King Icon Legend. A what? King Icon Legend. Oh, I thought it was like one word. Yeah, totally. Because <laughs> who's a chaotic mess? Me. <laughs> so. And who has to help maintain order you. around here? <laughs> <laughs> everyone else On most occasions, yes. everyone else because i am what chaotic so before we get into today's episode on this buffoonery of a movie we're talking about today in the description below you'll see a link to the link tree that will take you to all the other podcasts in the ionic void productions you'll take you'll also see a link to the youtube channel on ionic void uh you also see a link to our twitter because we're not calling it by that dumb name we're on twitter at s-p-o-o-k-o-c-a-l-y-p-s-e baby we do spooky stuff and again like last week babes like last week we have a sponsor we're sponsored by audible baby you want to listen to some spooky books i mean like the movie we're talking about today is based on a book you could probably i mean you could probably find it on there Probably. It's H.G. Uh, Wells. What are you referring to? The Invisible Man. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Spoiler alert. Probably. <laughs> so I'm sure you could find the original book by H.G. Wells on there. I'm, I'm sure of it. But yeah, in the, in the description below, you'll find a link that'll take you to a free trial. As well as it'll come with a free audiobook. Um, but yeah, it's audibletrial.com slash void. The flavor meant, um, was there a flavor or something in this? Um, no, but I'll throw out black licorice. Oh, love black licorice. I don't know why. It feels weirdly appropriate, maybe because like it's not a very commonly seen flavor. It's an unhinged flavor for an unhinged character. <laughs> you know what? But I, I guess I guess right. Yeah, because people think black licorice is just so weird, and I live for black licorice. And this character we're going to talk about today is fucking insane. I mean, he is described as quite mad, but yeah, today's movie is The Invisible Man from 1933. Woo! So, The Invisible Man was released October 31st, 1931. It is the next one to be released right after um it was 1933. Sorry, 1933, not 31. Oh my god. Halloween 1933. And it was the next universal classic monster film that was released after um The Mummy. Now I think there was other films release other horror other horror films released between The Mummy and The Invisible Man, but as far as the classic monster films go. The Invisible Man was te- is technically the next one in line there. Uh, this one was directed by James Whale. And it stars Bunyip. Get um, the names over for the actors. Hang on. I, I, I was looking at the producer and it was um, like Carl Lamel Le- Jr. Yeah. Oh. I think Carl Lamel is also in like both. Like the one without Junior and with Junior? Huh. I think that was in like the beginning credits. Like one was part of production and another one may have... Uh, I don't remember the exact credits, but the point is I saw both their names and I was like, I saw them in other films. Well, he was the um, co-founder and owner of Universal Pictures to 1934. The, norm- the, the senior, not the junior. Oh, they both worked on Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. 
And then they, it was like, do you guys want to work on the Invisible Man? They're like, no, we want to do Frankenstein first. It's like, oh, okay. And then they brought up Invisible Man during the same year Frankenstein was being made. And then eventually we got this movie. But we've and, got, it, um, and of course, this was H.G. Wells, the Invisible Man. Sorry, continue. Okay, uh, for our, our cast, we have Gloria Stewart as Flora Cranley. We have Claude Rains as Dr. Jack Griffin, a.k.a. the Invisible Man. We have William Harrigan as Dr. Arthur Kemp, Henry Travers as Dr. Cranley, Una O'Connor as Jenny Hall. Uh, is she the really loud lady in the movie? I think so. Oh, she's like <laughs> one of the best parts. She Just is. overreactions to everything. Oscar worthy. Uh, Forrester Harvey as Herbert Hall. Dudley um, Digges? Digges? I haven't seen that name. Um, as Chief of Detectives, we have. E.E. E. Clive as Police Constable Jaffers, Dwight Fry returning as reporter, and Merle Tottenham as Millie. Fun fact, Gloria Stewart lived to be 100 years old and died September 26, 2010. Wow. Yeah, she lived to be 100. She has that look of like, like a definitely a classic Hollywood actress, mainly with right. Her. Yeah, she has that cl- classic Hollywood look. Like if you were to see a documentary about like the beginning of film, she would, I imagine she would definitely show up just like, here's a significant figure from Hollywood. Oh, yeah. Starring roles such as Gloria in, in I mean, as Flora in The Invisible Man and that kind of stuff. Now, um, the guy who plays... Uh, the guy who plays the Invisible Man. I lost my train of thought. Scratch my thought. Okay, budget, budget for this movie. The movie for the budget for this movie was very extremely high for this time period, as well as compared to the other monster films that released prior. So the budget for this movie was three hundred twenty-eight thousand and thirty-three dollars. That may not seem like a lot to us now, since movies are made with billions. And million, millions and billions of dollars. But let me fucking tell you, this budget is almost triple what The Mummy was. And even more so compared to the first two. But the reason why this budget was so high is because of the special effects work that they did for this movie. Um, Because, I mean, he's invisible. The Invisible Man. And the fact on how they did it. Okay. As much as this movie was campy and ridiculous, I will give them props. They really worked their butts off with trying to make it, make it believable that this man was invisible with the way they shot, with the way they edited the film and the way they used, um, apparently they used mirrors and lights tricks as well as my running theories that when they were editing this film they actually like cut parts out of it out of film and pasted it in others to kind of fit it all together because that's the only way I can think about how they would do it as far as some of the scenes in this movie but the special effects budget was high for the time period so if you watch this movie for nothing else watch it for that because it's it's a it's a sight to see for the stuff, the stuff that they pulled with the, during this time period. Okay, so plot. So it's a it's a snowy night. We have a stranger who's covered head to toe with winter clothing, and his face is just swathed in bandages, and he's got dark goggles on his face. He goes to the Lion's Head Inn in the English village of Iping in Sussex. I think so. Yeah, and he shows up, and everybody just looks at him funny, and you can tell he's a bit of a dickhead because when he walks through, he doesn't even shut the door behind him. Nope. Like it's snowing, it's cold. Doesn't shut the door, and he's like, "I want a room." And like, um, we don't really have any rooms ready. And he's like, "You can get one ready." No. Nah. Yeah. Damn. Rude. <laughs> and they do get one ready, and then there's people kind of talking about him. Like, he might be some kind of criminal. That's why he's hiding his face. He's like, no, maybe he's in a severe accident. Like, they're just speculating. 
but then he goes up to the room and he demands to be left alone. Like there's one of my favorite scenes, like he's just standing there and the lady helping him is um Jenny. Mm-hmm. He's like, May I take your hat and coat for the dry off? And he's like, No. And she just like it's a close up on her. She just looks surprised, like no one's ever said no to me to that kind of request before. Like he defies social norms. Yeah. <laughs> God. This movie, he is unhinged, y'all. <laughs> Insane. Yep. And then there's also some hints that like of what's beneath his mask when um it's like I forgot to bring up the mustard. And then Jenny goes up there and like he's in the middle of eating, but then he like he quickly covers his mouth. And he's like, uh, just just leave the mustard and get out. I was like, all right. And then you see that he doesn't have a chin. Like it's just invisible. Yeah. <gasps> what is this man? And then later he has like a, a lab set up in his room and he's propped the door closed and then he like shouts at Jenny to leave. And then she screams. He's like, talks to her husband, Mr. Hall. He's like, you need to get him out of here. He hasn't paid any of his rent. And he's like, fine, I'll go up there. And then they have an argument. And then he, the um, invisible man throws Mr. Hall down the stairs. Yeah. And then they contact the police. And the policeman shows up. Yeah. He kind of looks like an English Bobby. And this does take place in England. But then they all, like, the whole crowd gets up there, and they bang on his door, and they enter in. And I was like, yeah, you've committed assault. You're going to have to come down the station. He's like, oh, I'm not going anywhere. He's like, oh, you want to see who I am? You want to see what I am? Let me just show you. And he removes all the bandages and his goggles, and he reveals that he's invisible. And he starts laughing maniacally, and he strips naked, (laughs) making himself completely (laughs) unseen. (laughs) And he's like ducks out the window i think or maybe he goes out the door but they they just they can't catch him because they can't see him yeah but i like how he's unwrapping his bandages and showing the inside of the bandage wrapped around his skull and it looks darker and i'm like how did you do that right and i think this is where it cuts to like um it's like some lab workers in a different scene and they discuss someone named jack griffin mm-hmm <laughs> And Jack Griffin is a person who discovered the secret of invisibility while conducting a series of tests involving an obscure drug called monocaine. And he's like, it comes from a flower from India, an extract. We tested this on clothing, and it destroyed the clothing. We tested this on animals, and it bleached their fur. And meanwhile, Griffin's like, I'm just going to inject this under my skin to see what happens. And he does this for like 30 days, and it completely renders him invisible. Yeah. So now we have an explanation as to how he's able to do this. And then this brings up Flora, who is Griffin's fiance and the daughter of Griffin's employer, Dr. Cranley. And Dr. Cranley is upset over Griffin being gone for a long time because they don't they don't know what happened to him. It's like, all right, we're gonna search his empty lab, see what we can find, and it shows a list of chemicals, including monocane. And Cranley is like, oh, this is dangerous. We've tested this on animals, and it's, um, well, it's not really good. Yeah. Then he goes back to the inn. Griffin turns up at Dr. Kemp's home, and he's forcing Kemp to become his partner. Because he's like, I'm going to plot world domination, and you're going to help me, because I need someone who can be visible. And he's like, we're going to kill some people here and there. Some people of high class, some people of low class. Just to tell him that we don't discriminate. Uh -uh. But he left his um, notebooks back at the inn that he was staying at. So like, we are like, "Ah, I need to get back there. So he makes him drive him there. And then they walk in through like the gate. He's like, okay, you're going to wait here below this window. I will drop off the books. Meanwhile, I'm just going to walk in because no one can see me. I don't care about the guards because, again, no one can see me. <laughs> yeah. And meanwhile, like, the police have arrived and everyone's doing a witness testimony. Just like, um, we didn't see him, but we know he's there. He did awful things. 
and the inspector is just like, man, this is all a hoax. You guys are all collectively crazy. You're all... <laughs> yes. And I was like, uh, I don't know. You have multiple witnesses, quote unquote. So I imagine none of them are really crazy. And then meanwhile, the invisible man shows up to just ruin things. Like he gets the yeah. pot and he just like throws it in the inspector's face. He's like, oh, what? <laughs> And then the Invisible Man runs upstairs, he gets his books, drops them off out the window, and then he goes back down and he kills the inspector. Yeah, he sure does. <laughs> Just so you know that he ain't messing around. He means business. Back at home, Dr. Kemp calls Cranley, and he's asking for help. And I think it was like, Griffin's here, he is the Invisible Man. And what's what I thought was a little odd... At first, but I guess it's because I missed it in the scene. When he calls Cranley, Cranley's like, uh, don't call the police. He'll get suspicious. We need him calm so that we can take him in. I was like, yeah. uh, okay, I guess I won't call the police. And then later the police show up. And I'm guessing it's because Cranley was talking to his wife and his wife was like, you should probably call the police. And I somehow yeah. kind of missed that. But yeah, they were going for something subtle. It was like, oh, it's Cranley and his wife showing up. And then later the police surround the place. And it's like, oh, well, looks like I'm going to have to hide. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Griffin realizes that Kemp has betrayed him. Yeah, he's like, at 10 o'clock the next night, I'm going to kill you. So uh -huh. Griffin escapes and he goes on a killing spree. Like, hilarious. like some of these kills are hilarious, not yes. murder, but because like how he derails a train, he's like, I'm going to go to the train switching tracks control panel and just switch them. And it just looks like a model train and it flips over like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, like, it just looks like a kid having fun with toys, even though it's actual people dying. <laughs> God, yeah. And there's like oh, tons of people going out on a search party, which proves fruitless because they're like, we can track his footprints, but we can't see him otherwise. And that's really hard to track somebody down by just footprints and not being able to see them at all. And he just messes with them. Like he gets this guy and he throws him off a cliff. Oh yeah. He ties up, he ties up a guy. Like they were using him as bait. He goes like a detective or some shit. And then he puts him in the passenger seat. He's like, we're going to go for a little drive, right? And then I'm oh, going to take yeah. off the brake, and then you're going to go off a cliff, and then you're going to fall and hit a boulder and die. And he's like, you don't have to do this. No, but I will. <laughs> and he gets out of the car. You hear the click clack, and he takes off the handbrake, and the car just goes. And I'm just like, the guy could just roll out. Oh, uh, uh, He was okay. Up, he? Yeah. But but there's no door holding him in. Yeah, not really. I mean, he could have just jumped out. <laughs> but he died in a fiery ball of flame and destruction. So I was like, damn, he got and fucked up. The links they tried to do to catch him. Like, it was ridiculous. Was like, Here is like, we're going to surround um, Kemp, but with like, 20 police guards we're going to wrap ourselves in the round in the net so that if he tries to enter into our circle we'll feel him we have a bunch of loose earth we've placed along the wall which is ruined by a stray cat yeah and then when they surround when they surround that place earlier and he like finds that one police officer rips his pants off as he's like spinning him around and throws him to their police and then he just puts the pants on and skips down the road after um was it Flora or some other lady? Um, I think it might have been Flora. Gloria, sorry. The Gloria is the actress. Flora is the character. Flora, sorry, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, right. I was like, what? No, you're right. I think it might have been Flora. I don't know if he skipped after Flora because he would not want to hurt her, right? So maybe he went after, um. Dr. Cranley's wife. That's fair. I don't remember all the characters, but him just skipping through and it's just a floating pair of pants. <laughs> yeah. 
But then he is finally caught because it's snowing. He has to seek shelter in a barn and some farmer shows up and he hears him snoring. I was like, um, I should tell somebody about this. He goes to the police and he says, like, he's in my barn. I can hear him breathing. I was like, oh, that must be him. And then they surround the place and then they set the barn on fire. I'm <laughs> hoping the farmer has insurance or something. Yeah. Be compensated. It causes the invisible man to have to rush out of the farm and he tries to sneak away, but you can see the footprints. And then the chief of police here opens fire and he shoots Griffin in the lung and he falls over. Yeah. Then he's taken to the hospital. And then Dr. Cranley tells everybody, like, the surgeon tells Dr. Cranley, like, hey, Jack Griffin here is dying, and he's asking him to see Flora. And then Griffin is remorseful about his actions, and he's like, I meddled in things that man must leave alone. And then as he dies, the chemical that was in his body making him invisible fades away, so then his body becomes visible, and you, you see the actor for the first time. Yeah. And that ends The Invisible Man. Dun, dun, dun. I like how they point out possible weaknesses that he has. Like he explains that if he eats and he's not wearing his clothing, his food could be visible for up to an hour. That's so weird. And even like dirt under his fingernails can give him away. So he has to be very clean. Yeah. So Which can, I mean. Like invisibility isn't all it's cracked up to be when you have like to take care of every minute detail to make sure you're not looking like some kind of floating debris. Yeah, that's fair. This movie was a rip and a half, y'all. He was un he was just unhinged. And the scene of him chasing a lady down the road with just his pants on and he's skipping. <laughs> it's I died. I was laughing my ass off so bad. Mm-hmm. It was so funny because she was like and he was like, la, la, la. And I'm like, what the fuck? He's just singing a jaunty tune. He is. He was. His antics are stuff out of Little Rascals. Literally. But he's murdering people. <laughs> so. I was like, people thought this was scary. I think this is just funny. Dark humor, yo. Dark humor. Because this. This. Uh, this movie, go watch it. You need to experience it. It was great. What I would compare this to the other films, like um, Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Mummy, they're all, I would say they're supernatural horrors. Yeah. He, I would classify The Invisible Man as almost a natural horror because he uses science to become an invisible. Yeah, science. he's very science fiction-y. Yeah. Like, he's not a monster in the traditional sense yeah it's more like he found power and he became mad with it i mean it's hg wells so that makes sense i i don't know that much about hg wells's work do you know about their work oh yeah hg wells was um a big science fiction writer um he did stuff with like time travel aliens. He did the, um, God, what was the movie called? He did the time machine. Um, the war of the worlds was his biggest work. One of his biggest works. Oh yeah. The war of the worlds war in the air. Um, when the sleeper wakes. So he did a lot of science fiction, a lot of dystopian type stuff. Yeah, War of the Worlds, I would say, is probably his biggest, um, most famous work outside of The Invisible Man. So he is very much into science fiction. So the fact that they took one of his creations and turned it more into a science fiction horror was ra- was quite interesting. But yeah, so you, we always talk about how Mary Shelley is the... I mean, granted, she's the mother of science fiction and horror, but they call H.G. Wells the father of science fiction because that's what he's most well known for for the genre. So, um, he's maybe the first male to write about science fiction. 
I would say so since they call him the father of science fiction. Um, cause his work is pretty notable for the genre back in the day. And he was a futurist and he did a lot of, um, uh, yeah. I mean, he did a lot of works for talking about invisibility, biological engineering, science experiments gone wrong or aliens and space and all that, all that fun stuff. Cause he was really interested in that in the science side of things rather than the um, horror. But I think the invisible man was his creation that kind of um, was in the middle of both. Cause I think the invisible man, the actual story itself was kind of on the horror side of things a little bit. From what I remember. This movie was also mentioned in the Queer for Fear documentary, and so it was, was used to show how being invisible was a gay metaphor. Um, could you elaborate on that, Zio? So the way, if I'm from the Queer for Fear, they're talking about how the allegory of being invisible um, as a, uh, in this case, I guess it would be a closet of homosexual trying his best to just be invisible so no one notices him and no one catches on to his gayness. Trying to hide in plain sight, but he's obviously not doing a very good job. <laughs> so that's what I would think the allegory for the whole, for the, um... And then when he gets naked for everybody <laughs> to not see, he's absolutely living it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's weird. That is weird and kind of a what kind of part of the metaphor. But when he's finally able to just be himself and be invisible and just be one with the gayness without everyone seeing him, without trying to put on some disguise. Because, I mean, throughout the movie, he put on like wraps and sunglasses and like these black sunglasses and a suit and shit. So he was trying to pose as something he's not. So when he finally just took off all his clothes and he was just invisible, you can kind of see that as a metaphor for him just embracing the weird, fully just becoming invisible and trying to... Or possibly embracing the fact that maybe no one will ever be able to see him in that. That's context. true. That's true. Because uh, people back then would see gay people and they'd be like, oh, they don't exist or just pretend they don't, like they they're not there. Their head, like they cover their eyes, like don't, yeah. don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. Don't look at them. And it's kind of just like, you know what? I'm going to thrive in that. Yeah, don't look at me, bitch. <laughs> so it's a, so you, you can interpret the invisible man a couple different ways. I think that way wasn't the way they used in Queer for Fear. But again, you can look at the metaphor of being invisible a couple different ways in this movie to the um to an lgbtqia um story lying away so there's multiple different ways to interpret it it's not really i would say there's not one correct way because you can look at it a couple different ways but um they did mention this movie or the invisible man for a, for a while in the one of the i don't remember which episode it was i think it was like what three I think it it might have been either three or two. Yeah, it was either two or three. They mentioned it, but yeah. Okay, symbolism. I mean, science experiments gone wrong. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the gayness. We're kind of talk, we kind of talked about the symbolism of that. So, kind of did that or <laughs> kind of already tackled that. I was like. He was also trying to impress Flora. I just, yeah, I just don't know in what way, like, because it was, it was already established that he was her fiance or she was his fiance. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. That that's that was a little weird. Because thinking about the gay metaphor, and you're just like, what? Then why would he try to impress? Her? Unless he's, unless he's like, unless this is like more of a, like a bisexual storyline. Or kind of like, and if you interpret it as a bisexual man, I can kind of see it. There's a lot. There's a lot there. 
that you yeah. can kind of look into. Plus, I don't know if it's really established like how he met Flora or what the relationship is. Beyond, I don't like, think oh, so. We're engaged to be married, but they don't seem all that close until no. the few times that they're meeting up. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You don't seem that close until the very end where he's just, where she's just like, I do care about you. You can also kind of interpret it as um, maybe she knows he's gay, but she's willing to marry him to kind of yeah, like a marriage help him of, hide it, I yeah, guess. Like, that kind of marriage. Like a, like yeah. a covering marriage. Yeah. Where she's like, I accept you for who you are, so I do, I do love you. But yeah, we're going to get married. <laughs> so and it's a matter of, is. yeah. The rating system, one out of five. Dancing, uh, pants. dancing pants. Yes. It's a hop skipping away. Um, I want to rate this movie a good. Mm, I mean, my favorite one is still. I still like Frankenstein a lot more. But this one was a fun one. I would say a 3.5. Out of five dancing pants. Like this movie was camp. I was living. Mm-hmm. Cause I think the highest one I gave was a four. And I think that was Frankenstein. Yeah. 3.5 for me. I think I'll also go with 3.5. Because like the other movies, there's still parts that there's just exposition where they're explaining things. Although when he's explaining like, here's what I intend to do and here's how I have to cover it for my weaknesses. Those are interesting, but then there's other parts. Basically when the invisible man is on screen, it sort of loses interest. Yeah. 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 That's pretty, that's about right. Other than that, seeing his antics is so great. Oh, it's great. It's, it's, it's ridiculous in the best way. If you give, Find, if you can get yourself a viewing of this movie on Blu-ray or DVD or you buy, rent it off YouTube or Amazon or something, t- do it. It's it's a fun watch. I mean, all these movies are basically movies you can have on the background while you're doing something else because you necessarily don't really need to, I would say, pay attention to completely. But this one, I would say, is one that you do because it's it's funny. It's it the, he's he's cr- cuckoo for cocoa buffs. Final thoughts? Mm, I like, I guess I like his style of shades. Like the first time they're goggles, but then the second time it's like, here's a pair of shades that also have a shade for peripheral vision. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I want to dress up with this guy. <laughs> like, oh my God, do him, it. But wear, wear like a green screen suit underneath it so that if you strip oh. naked and you get filmed, they can just key you out. It's like, oh, oh my, my gosh, God. it's the Invisible Man. Oh. <laughs> it would only work on video, though. Like in person, be like, yeah. why are you green? I'm like, look, it's it'll make sense in the edit. Yeah, it'll make sense in the edit. <laughs> so. Yeah, but that's it. Well, on that note, thank you all for listening to today's episode. The rating is 3.5 out of 5 from The Invisible Man. Go check it out. Out in the world, y'all. So that is today's episode. Catch us next time as we talk about another film monster. Next time, we're going to the Lady of the Monsters. Who is that? Find out next time. Until then. Just the one. Yeah, there's only one there's only one female monster. So far. Okay. I mean, in the in the in the movies that we're gonna be talking in about, the legendary universals. Yeah, in the constant universal is only one. <laughs> but who is that? Find out next time. Until then, bye. Goodbye.